Hello everyone. So I keep thinking what do I say in English about a book that's written in English and what's the point? But I noticed and I told this to Professor Rambukwale that many people watched the program I did on his English article. In fact, more people watched it in English than in Sinhala. So that there might be an interest of English speakers themselves coming to listen to something about an English book. And the next question I was dealing with is like, you know, how do you introduce a book uh, on a YouTube space? Um, and what I thought I would not do is to go page by page or, you know, carefully chapter by chapter because it will not be, may not be interesting very much since it's a YouTube channel and I'm not doing a university lecture. My idea is to just talk about <clears throat> what the book is, what it deals with, some of the ideas it brings forth and why they are important and what he really wants to do in the book so that I can do in a very uh, brief uh, space of time and that is what I will do since the interview that I did with the writer deal with some of the issues that the book raises so I will let the writer actually speak about it in a very uh, in you know that that might be more interesting than me trying to explain some of the things that he has said in the book but i also realized me giving a very quick introduction will make it easy for you to transition into the interview which is also going up on my youtube channel at the same time um the politics and poetics of authenticity uh, and the subtitle is a cultural genealogy of singhala nationalism right so nationalism as you know it's it's a concept that in a way all of us are living through nations are the reality of the political world now and the, the world is divided into nations and we take it as such an obvious fact that we forget that nations themselves were a pretty recent invention maybe the 18th century in europe 18th 19th and for us the south asian uh, countries or the African countries that went through colonialism the nation was born after that process with uh, you know with the British leaving and then Ceylon emerged and became Sri Lanka in 1972 India emerged and uh, when I say emerged not that the country wasn't there before but it was probably not as one entity called India there were kingdoms and you know we are a powerful monarch governed areas it was the same in europe so earlier maybe in europe it was based on religion like the holy roman empire or something and there were empires so the whole nation concept like italy greece or whatever is pretty recent and this is something that we forget that this wasn't always the way things were and that is why i think you know knowing those things can help and uh, Professor Rambukwale deals with the concept of nation. He needs to define the terms. And when you say a cultural genealogy of Sinhala nationalism, he needs to explain uh, nationalism as well. It's not easy to explain. So one of the dangers I run when I try to simplify or just summarize the ideas of a book is I might make it sound simple when in reality what he's saying is not. But the way I defend myself or what I'm doing is it's better to have some knowledge than none at all because if you are proficient in reading English please uh, read the original book this is an open access book which means you can go to the internet and download it legally it's free for anyone and also one of the other things that is good in a brief explanation is academic writing may not be that very easy to read so if you are worried about your language level, this introduction might help you um, come into this book. So this is a hard copy, but this is available online as a soft copy for anyone to download. Um, nationalism, again, like my discussion with him last, last month, has been a very fraught event in South Asia. If you take the Indian example, you realize how much pain it cost when India and Pakistan was born. Bangladesh, East Bangladesh, West Bangladesh, you know, all these things, how, how um, 
much bloodshed happened within that. And we are used to being uh, told by the West that it's a very violent process, the South Asian birth of nationalism. And where Professor Rabukpala very rightly points out, they forget that even their births as nations is very often violent because the nation itself, the very process is about outsiders and insiders, those who don't belong and those who belong. It's punitive in that sense. But these are not things that they or we say or we remember. So that erasure is part of Europe's memory as well. They won't talk about what pain it would have cost them to come out as nations because those are erased from memory and they look at us and say, my goodness, look at how they deal with it. So to kind of take away judgment and know that this process was always about inclusiveness and considering somebody as other. So that's an interesting point he makes. And uh, to come to the title, authenticity, what does, it, what does it mean? You know, it's, in English, it's easier to explain because something authentic means true, not false, indigenous, what is there. And the singular term, which you might immediately uh, associate with it, when, which he uses in his uh, definition, is apekama. So you could say deshi atvaya or whatever. The apekama, he traces how this concept was born because... Uh, Professor Rabukpal is not interested in nationalism as a concept, but he's interested in seeing is seeing how it was practically made to come about, what practice or discourses or physical um, occurrences happen to for this to grow, the genealogy of it to get to be born and to grow. And it's very interesting. He does it by analyzing three characters. Two are, who are considered in, extremely important uh, in our history, Anagarika Dharmapala and SWRD Bandaranayaka. And he analyzes the material he does is they, he talks about their memoirs or their speeches and discusses how they have uh, dealt with the concept of authenticity. And the third character he deals with is a writer, a still living writer, one of the best we have, Gunadas Amarasekara who through his fiction <clears throat> dealt with the process of trying to find what is ours, what is ourness, opekama, ourness, authenticity, through his fiction. He wrote a series in which he allegorically followed a character through, you know, the, the post-colonial times and, you know, how, how he went on his journey finding out the very important question like, who am I? What is me? What does it mean to be? You know, in this case, Singhala. These questions are valid to anybody and anyone because uh, the, the colonial project was such a harmful thing that all of us who came out with, from it can never be the same. Even if I personally wasn't caught, you know, my, my parents or my grandparents were and their attitudes come down to us. So none of us are free from these things. And Professor Ambukwal starts this book with a very interesting cultural occurrence which happened in 2016 where Kishani Singh sang Danno Budunge in an operatic voice and there was quite a backlash. Uh, she did it in an, um, an Independence Day celebration and how the backlash was based on this Apekama thing. You don't sing that song that way kind of thing and how she, her defense also involved in her saying I'm trained in this particular uh, skill of opera operatic singing but my credentials are i'm a visakian and a buddhist and so on so that even for defense you still fall back on what you think makes you you so it, it's a very interesting book because it, it it deals with what makes you you what we considered us he deals with the singular buddhist specifically but i think it will be very interesting to for any ethnic group in this country to do such an analysis, analysis and see, you know, where you think your identity lies. And um, to go to the three main characters, he, S.W. Ardai Banda Naik is the more political uh, analysis and uh, Professor Ambukwala sometimes thinks of, or, or in that story, he, he locates all these characters in their complexity we tend to, especially father figures or heroes, we tend to draw this um, 
kind of a homogeneous picture with everything clearly cut and someone who knew what was happening very clearly. That happens when we are in the present, we look back at the past. But this kind of historical analysis shows the complexities that can exist in characters and, and, and show us that maybe things were not as definite for them either. So in SWRD Bandaranaika's case, he analyzes the fact that he was born a Christian but became a Buddhist and then how universal suffrage, the fact that anyone could vote, suddenly made those who wanted to be nationalist leaders needed to represent themselves as representing the masses. And therefore something had to be imagined, like what kind of lifestyle do the masses have? And thereby the paddy cultivation and the lakes and the dagabas were given as imaginary and how it was imagined. And very often imagined by people who were in power, therefore not among the masses. So interesting things like that. And how um, one analysis he does so is Oxford, the Oxford memoirs of SWRD Bandaranaika, where he analyzes his location of, um, you know, being a black person within Oxford and how he was determined to somehow overcome the, the prejudices they had and how he does succeed in, you know, becoming, I think, the secretary or something of the Oxford Union. So how he kind of a hero story within that. But Professor Amukpala also says at no point does he condemn the British behavior or doesn't challenge that. His object was to be considered noble within that framework. So, you know, the complications like that. And um, then with uh, Anagarika Dharmapala, definitely that was a more religious uh, crusade if one was political. And how, like, we know Anagarika Dharmapala as the person who made the Mahabodhi Society, uh, Buddhist, sorry, the Mahabodhi Society and Mahabodhi, uh, the Buddhist side. He, he accomplished those. And then how he worked with Colonel Alcott and Madame Blavitsky at the beginning with the Theosophists coming to Sri Lanka, to Ceylon and how the Buddhist schools were made. Later, of course, here Professor Ambukwala talks about him falling out with the Theosophists because the Theosophists were interested in a more global Buddhism, a universal kind of uh, Buddhism. And at the beginning, uh, Dharmapala was also part of that. He went to Chicago and, you know, spoke to transnational Buddhists. But then within Ceylon, it was a very particular Ceylonese Buddhism. So this kind of... Um, conflict led to the fallout where he was later becoming a, a proper like standing up for a particular Buddhism within the country. So Professor Rambukwala shows complications there as well and analyzes why sometimes he may have um, spoken against particular communities. He did not condemn colonialism as such but he very openly condemned the so-called impurities or what he said, the bad practices that came with the white people. And mainly he meant drink, alcohol and alcoholism. So he had this very didactic way of uh, telling Sinhala people, just stop, stop, be, be, go back to what you were, don't fall into these vices and all that. And um, it was interesting. And Professor Ambukpal also wonders, like his uh, problem wasn't so much with, the Tamil minority, but the coastal Moors, and whether that had any any link to the fact that Dharmapala also was born from a within a trading family, you know, quite a wealthy family who was involved in trade, and whether economic reasons could have been one of the things, one of the reasons for him to say, "Be careful, they have come to take what is ours." So looking back to see how. Um, Things may have been is a very interesting task by itself. And we also have to remember when we look at things like that, um, especially the Bandaranaika case also, we might consider the present divisions that we have, we lived through. We might project it back to the past and think that this was the way things were. But Professor Ambukwala's analysis shows that maybe there were other divisions which was more valid during that time. For example, the, the call for federalism first came from the Candian Sinhalese who wanted to be separate from the low country Sinhalese, right? And within the Tamil community, caste was a hugely 
divisive factor. And anecdotally, I don't think Professor Amukwala speaks of it there, that, uh, um, you know, Armugam Navala's revival of the Tamil revival, as people like Cheran say, it's more a, a cast, uh, is, is of the Vellala cast. They were the ones who were, you know, like kind of made to be revitalized and it wasn't like a homogeneous block. So this analysis, like what Professor Amukwala does, makes us look back to things that we had considered homogeneous and shows the divisions and the complexities and the heterogeneity within it, which I think is very important if we are to think of a, of a, of a Sri Lanka in which we try to live more at peace with each other. And finally, what he does ask is for a critical thinking and not just for one race. If all of us look at our location more critically, not just the Sinhala Buddhists, maybe the Sinhala Christians, the Muslims and the Tamil, we need to reflect on our own positioning in history and to see how nothing is a simple narrative. Nothing is as, as uh, homogeneous or as clear as sometimes history makes it. So analysis like these are very, very important. And the chapter on... Gunada Samarasekar, interestingly, um, Harshana Rambukwala calls it the life and death of authenticity. So where does the death part come? I mean, in the interview, he makes it very clear. No one has a right to say, you know, something has died because nothing, everything lives in some form or other. But um, he says in the 80s, the 80s became a time where the Sinhala race needed to question themselves very, uh, very strongly. And that did happen through scholars and everybody with the 83 riots and also the 87, 88, uh, 88, 89 uh, JBP, second JBP insurrection so that our own sense of identity was threatened at very high levels like who are we kind of thing and how scholarship also followed that. He does give a glimpse about the fact that sometimes scholarship also became very dicey at points because there were some things some historians could say and they could be called traitorous. Right, so that it became not an objective thing. The example he gives is the argument or the discussion or the back and forth between Ralph Gunavad, R.A. L.H. Gunavad, and K. No Dharmadasa, both professors. Like, and, and he gives examples of what happens in these discussions. So to get back to life and death of authenticity, by death he meant that after the 80s, the latter part of the 80s, something happened in which our sense of that apekama was threatened. And he puts that threat uh, definitely to the media because he says uh, you, during the latter part of the 80s, private media channels came to, be, came to be and the authority that the government media had on art, for example, what they called high art, Sambhavya Sangeet, which was very much part of the Apekama kind of feeling if you take the songs by Amaradeva or you know the songs that were popular, it had a particular lifestyle. Or a, or, a, or a imaginary that was idealized and that was probably threatened because there was a cassette culture and then people like um, Jyotipala came into the picture and in fact that argument was about Jyotipala's funeral which had attracted thousands of people and Professor Saratamunugama had written a, 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 an article in which he says probably that, that cultural ethos we grew up is now dead and suddenly this popular culture is now what, what is there. So that popular culture had wasn't very, um, wasn't very uh, respectful of what we had called the Sambhavya or the authentic us. So there were these cultural debates. And again, very interesting. I lived through it for somebody who, for somebody who hadn't lived, if you're young, younger, a young person looking at this, watching this program, please have a look to see what these cultural uh, debates were. And an example in which this writer, Gunadasa Amarasekara, had discussed it is a very beautiful short story called uh, Gal Pilimea Saha Bol Pilimea, which uh, Professor Abukpala analyzes here. So that was, it's a short story in Singhala about a stone statue and a hollow statue. Because during the time of Premadasa, uh, there were a lot of Gammudavas in which replicas of original statues were taken all over the island. And then this is, this story is about one false hollow false statue being laid alongside a real stone statue and how people 
start worshipping that gold painted one and how the very um, faithful security guard or Murakaru, the person who is looking after the caretaker of the stone statue is very, very angry because he thinks that this shouldn't be done. But what Amara Sekara doesn't do is wonder whether the stone statue is also, um, you know, whether that's authentic or whether that was also created. Um, and then, you know, allegorically explaining this dilemma, what is real then, right? So then uh, Professor Bukwala in the sixth, he had three chapters on the three characters. He had the introduction, the second one where he uh, theorizes on, you know, this, the concept of nationalism, history, religion, all on, within the Sri Lankan context, Ceylon and then Sri Lanka. And the sixth chapter is a very, like, not a very long one where he kind of says why it's important that we uh, think about it. And his final call is linked to my article which I did last month and I explained to you that it's a very good uh, intervention like uh, introduction to this book because what he finally says is um, maybe it's a his call is for a critical acceptance of everything and not going into this or that or saying we don't need history or whatever so this will be clearer when we have the discussion which you can watch either before or after this but it's not it's not that these things do not exist or you cannot say there's nothing called us or anything of course there's something called us we all grow as within a culture and there's no way any one of us any writer or professor Abukwali included can look at it like from up there thinking he is not within a subjective location all of us are and there's no way you should not say you, you should not do this or should not do that. That's your lifestyle. But whatever you do, it's nice to have knowledge of how things came to be. So that in case of uh, any issue, you're informed about the position that you take. So one of the reasons I do this channel is to not because I have answers or Professor Ambukwela has answers. It's nice to it's actually very empowering to look at some issues in their complexity so that you might know that there are more to issues than what you originally thought there were. Because my own process of, uh, I'm waiting for my PhD results, I realized that how much I don't know when I did my PhD. So that process was important. Um, it's not actually about knowing what the right answers are. It's about knowing what the right questions are and thinking of how this can be and how that can be and you know the complexities the heterogeneity the complexities of who we are and how we were made to come to this point so um i think that's enough as an introduction to this book so six chapters and the last one uh basically asking um for critical analysis of your own location and everything else um be, please do listen to the interview because there i get him to explain more in more detail it's always when the writer agrees to come to my channel it's always better that you have the original author discussing about some of these issues so thank you very much um and next month in february we take up another writer and i will see you then thank you